to another year of Beacom, like the car auctions at Kissimmee. A lot of classic cars, like exotic cars, like rare cars here this year. So let's get going. Now, I saw this truck last weekend and I really looked it over really good. Chevrolet C10, probably the best looking C10 I've ever seen. With the air ride suspension, beautiful, beautiful paint. Still kept the original steering wheel with the leather interior, but it has the uh, 67, 68 front end on it. But of course, LS powered, but it looks like it's a small block Chevy kit on it with fuel injection, of course, AC. For these custom tubs here on the covering the wheel wells. You usually see these open, but they made these custom tubs. I love these race line wheels. Very well done. 69 C10. It's another shot of the interior. Beautiful. And I love what they did with the the ashtray. It the ashtray is the house for the uh, air rise suspension controls. It actually pulls out and slides down to access it easier instead of just having like a random switch just lay on the floor. Very cool. Of course, you have a Dimaggio Pantera and a Jaguar E-Type. These are the earlier E-Types. These are ones that doesn't have the square tail lights, which are like mandated by the US. And they had the bigger bumpers as well. These are like, this is like the perfect year E-Type Jag. With the enclosed headlights. Here's a beautiful 1997 Dodge Viper GTS Coupe. One of the first years they had a hard top and roll up windows and outside door handles. Or a push button anyway with the blue with the white stripe Shelby racing colors very well taken care of and of course the 8.4 liter v10 these forward opening hoods which are at the time was the most expensive part you could get at a dealership of any manufacturer these hoods were like it made crazy expensive and of course up here you have a Shelby Series 1, which is the only time really Carroll Shelby worked with GM. As you can tell, these are actually Corvette door handles off of C5. A lot of GM influence here, which really was the interpret of what a Cobra was going to look like if it was made in the late 90s. That was actually the thought process behind these cars. And they're actually going up in value over the years. And of course my generation remember these from the Need for Speed games around that time as well. And of course these are also built Aurora powered. Very cool unique pieces. Even have a Shelby Cobra inspired gas fuel cap at his factory as well. Very cool cars. Now this is a rare Camaro. Even though it doesn't look like much, this is actually an original, non-restored 1969 Copo Camaro. Now the Copo Camaro, what makes that special is Copo stands for Central Office Production Order, which means you have to actually know somebody in GM to get a special order Camaro. In which if you wanted a stripped out Camaro with a 427 in it, you couldn't get that way from the factory, so you had to special order it, which is what this one is. Which this car has the all aluminum 427, and this also has these DL1 package. Which DL1, you only that's the only package you can get with the all aluminum 427. And of course, with the four speed, wouldn't have it any other way. This is just a bare bones Camaro, as you can tell, it's all original, has the oxidized paint on top. It's not perfect, but it's all original, non-restored. This is probably a $250,000 car right here, as it sits. <laughs> this is the real deal right here. This is a 1970 Plymouth Hemicuda. There it is, 426 cubic inches. All black. Four speed with a pistol grip shifter. This has only 16,000 original miles on it. I 
I like it how it has the hard top, not the vinyl roof. Very well presented with so many low miles. Very cool with the frame and shaker hood. What more could you ask for with this car? It just if I ordered a CUDA back in 1970, this probably what it would look like right here. Here's a really rare Chrysler product you don't see a lot of. It's a 1956 Chrysler 300B. One of the first early generations of the, what you call the Chrysler letter cars. These were actually one of the early versions of the Hemi engine that came out in the early 50s. And these cars also had a lot of NASCAR pedigree. These were actually campaigned by Carl Kiefer, which was the first really big super team in NASCAR that had multiple cars on one team, which had drivers like Tim Flock, Buck Baker, and a few other well-known drivers as well. This one actually has the Hemi engine in it, the 354, 355 horsepower. Take a look inside. Very nice. This car actually came out of a private collection in Arizona. And it's currently, it was on the block on Wednesday and it's currently on the Big Goes On. Very nice detail. Look at the handle comes out like this. Instead of just pushing a button here and open the door. Not overdone, but the big rear fins that were popular in the 50s. Chrysler kind of kept the tame and classy for these models. But it's very cool to see one at this auction. Race car versions of these were actually the same color as this. But actually had like Mercury outboard boats on it. They usually had three digit numbers like 301, 302, 300, B to coincide with the car model. Here's something really cool. This is Bobby Ellis' 1969 Dodge Daytona. And this was totally restored. You see his open face helmet, which is period correct. And these are the blowers for the rear brakes. Very cool. Actually, from what, different from what history wants to tell you, Bobby Allison really was the unofficial first driver to go 200 miles an hour in a closed course. And it did in one of these Dodge Daytonas. And this, it could have been this car as well. But of course, Buddy Baker actually got the official record. Check this out. It actually has like fake wood paneling on the dash, which was to mimic the actual dash you see in a 69 Charger. And of course, you have the four speed. And this is a period correct style seat you would have saw. As you can tell, there's a lot of headroom. Especially if you had an open face helmet, you can see all around you compared to what it is today. And of course you have the Hemi engine, which eventually was outlawed and then brought back, but on a lower scale. Of course you have the nose cone, you have that famous wing in the back that helps stabilize the car. Especially if it went sideways, that wing would just actually straighten the car out with little to no effort but on the driver. And of course his crew chief at the time was Mario Rossi. This is a actual Mario Rossi car according to the paperwork. And Bobby Allison himself actually confirmed that this is one of his actual cars like a decade ago. There's documentation to back that up. These cars actually raced in 69 and 70 season. They were eligible for the 71 Daytona 500. They almost won the 71 Daytona 500 but was outlawed by NASCAR shortly thereafter. Even with a 305 engine in it. This is a 1969 Yanko Camaro prototype. This is the very first 1969 Camaro 
that Don Yanko actually put a 427 in to test it out and see how it would perform in this body. Test it out, make sure everything was right before he actually produced these from his dealership to be the famous Yanko Camaros. These were the cars that really put him on the map and this is the very first one that started it all. This is pretty amazing right here. This is a 1955 300 SL Goldwing. Now when these came out, these were like the fastest production cars on the market in 1955. As you can see, very high quality with a matching suitcase in the back. And it had tapered ends on it so it could fit in the trunk. Fit exactly like in the back, like you see there. Of course, the famous gold wing doors. Let's take a walk through the maze of wing cars. Here it is. This is one of the Halo cars of the auction today. 1992 Ferrari F40, which I believe is probably the best Ferrari ever built. 2.9 liter dual overhead cam, twin turbo, gated shifter. They're all painted this red. The famous Ferrari, Rosa Corsa red. We have one that came through last year, I think went for almost $2 million. I don't know if this is the same car or not. And of course, it's clear back window so you can see the 2.9 liter engine with the twin turbos and of course it wouldn't be a Mika auction without a real Shelby Cobra 1966 427 four-speed Cobra of course with the side pipes and the wide tires in the back it's very rare you see these cars without Carroll Shelby signature right here now this is a pretty famous Mopar this is the actual Black Ghost from Detroit, which is a very famous street racing car from that early 70s era, especially probably along Woodward Avenue. The original owner of this car was a police officer for the Detroit Police Department. He actually street raced as a hobby at night and was practically one of the fastest cars in that time period in the Detroit area, and it was a very well-known car. Now to celebrate this car, it's not being auctioned off here at Kissimmee, it's going to be later on in the year at Indianapolis. Dodge actually made a special edition Challenger for this year being the last year of the Challenger called the Black Ghost. And this is the first public display of this car. And as you can see, the differences between a normal Challenger and this one, they actually put Dodge above the front grille just like you would see on a 70 Challenger. This car actually has the Gator Skin vinyl roof on it and they actually replicated that on this car. I don't know if you can see the pattern on it, but it does have the gator skin pattern on the roof, which is only for the black Ghost Edition cars. And this is actually a 426 Hemi car, four speed, and it actually has a trailer hitch on the back, which I can't tell you the last time. <laughs> this might be the only Hemi Challenger that has a trailer hitch on it. Now there's a bunch of wing cars at this auction, but this is a rare opportunity to see a Daytona and a Superbird side by side. Now these came out first in 1969. They're only 503 made. Dodge wouldn't allow Richard Pay to drive one, so he went to Ford for 69. In order for him to come back for 70, they built the Superbird and they rushed these out in like a six month period. It was eligible for NASCAR for 1970. So this is pretty cool. You see both examples right next to one another. You can tell the differences. Of course, the Daytonas are a little more well put together and the Superbirds are a little more rushed even though they made more of them. They made just about enough for every Dodge and Chrysler dealer to have two per dealership, which is around 2,000 cars or so. This is actually a Hemi Superbird, which is really rare. rare. And this is a also a numbers matching Hemi Dodge Daytona. Which I know the Dodge Daytona, they only made 70 total of the Hemi Dodge Daytonas out of the 503. This is one of them. And of course, on these Superbirds, they rushed them out so much that all of them had a vinyl top from the factory. They actually had a plug put in the rear back window. Because the actual rear window is about like this high. 
So they put a plug back here and they put a small rear window in for better aerodynamics. And which on the Daytona, it's a smooth back rear window without the normal sails you see. These are, this is actually a five, Charger 500 body, which had a smoother back window, which they use for the Daytonas. And of course, these are the wheel well. They cut the hole out and put these vents over it because uh, to let air out for downforce. But also there was a rumor that these were for because tires were rubbing up against the fender, which is not true. These are actually to let air out for aerodynamic purposes. And of course, the famous nose cone, Daytona, and of course, Super birds are a little bit different. They actually have this piece on here for a law regulation. So they can actually have a front bumper. Now these cars are like peak 1930s for me. 1937 Cord and 1935 Auburn Boattail Speedster Supercharged. They're actually like the first mass produced front wheel drive cars in America. And I think these were like one of the first supercharged mass produced cars in the US as well. This is just top luxury for 1930s. You think it's like straight out of the Great Gatsby or something. <laughs> Probably never in my life again, I'll see both these cars together. Here's some drag racing history right here. This is a 1968 Ronnie Sox 426 Himikuda. Of course, Ronnie Sox is a great drag racing legend. Super stock, I think pro stock champion as well. According to the paperwork, this was raced by Ronnie Sox himself, but it doesn't give great detail of where it was raced. Now this is pretty cool. This is a 1968 AMC Javelin. And this car was actually raced at the Bonneville Salt Flats with Craig Breedlove. If you know who Craig Breedlove is, he drove the Spirit of America rocket cars in the 1960s. And he actually drove this car on the Bonneville Salt Flats and set a record for 161 miles an hour for the C production class. And this has the 390 in it from AMC. And of course the famous American Motors red, white, and blue paint scheme. I always loved AMC. It was a nice alternative to the big three automakers in the 1960s. And they don't get enough credit like they should. Now this is awesome. This is a 1991 GMC Cyclone and a 1992 GMC Typhoon. You never see these together. This is what happens at Meekum. You see a lot of things you never saw before. They both have the 4.3 liter V6, all wheel drive. Performance SUV before SUVs really caught on. Really trace the performance lineage in these cars back to the Grand National. I mean, zero to 60 in these cars were less than four and a half seconds. I mean, which was pretty quick for back in the day. But not for certain, I think the truck, the Cyclones were faster than the Typhoons, but I could be wrong. To tell a Typhoon or a Cyclone from their normal counterpart, they usually have the bold out fenders, different wheels. Most of them are usually black. Here's are the stock wheels. You would usually call them on both either the Cyclone and the Typhoon. But I do like the upgraded wheels that you would see like on a Corvette. It fits the look. I mean, these are going up in value every year because they're getting very sought after, so. GMC Cyclone, GMC Typhoon. 90s SUV muscle. Here's some racing history right here. This is Mario Andre's 1984 IndyCar Championship winning race car. Campaign during the 1984 Kart World Championship season. This is a Lola Cosworth. Cosworth engine, Lola chassis, Lola bodywork. This is something special, 1985 Lamborghini Countach. I prefer the earlier Countach models because these have the, the regulator bumpers in the front and in the back they have a different rear fascia. But it's still iconic. Have the OZ wheels. Of course the Lamborghini doors, your inlets for the rear engine. Of course that famous wing. And here's the late 80s, mid 80s rear tail light kit and panel. I prefer the earlier ones that had the more 
square tail lights. This has a slit tail lights. And of course the light. You always saw this car on posters, especially in the 80s in the kids' bedrooms. So this car relates to a lot of people. And of course your small side window. Yep. You can barely get anything in there, but it worked. There's also two other Countach's here. There's, the other two are 25th anniversary cars, and they're also white. My head hurts just by looking at this car with all the mistakes that are on it, because good thing they're not actually representing it as a Rusty Wallace stock car. It's actually a 1998 stock car body, but it actually has Dodge Charger headlights and taillights. And to my recollection, he never ran this paint scheme on this body. He ran the Miller Light scheme from 1997 forward. And from, I think, 1991 through 1996, he ran the gold and black Miller Junior and Draft scheme. So this is like a totally, everything is totally not what it's supposed to be. Because look, these are the Dodge headlights that were on the Charger from like late 2000s to early 2010s. Here's the interior shot. I don't even know if this is a Penske chassis. I don't even see the number on the roll bar. But there's your quarter windows, your Ford Taurus. And same back here. There's your Charger taillights on a Taurus body. I mean, it's cool. I wish this scheme would have ran with this body style, but it's just not correct. He had their own set of like switches. I think it would have said Penske on here if it was a real Penske car. It is what it is. It'd be a fun weekend toy for road racing. All right, this is probably gonna be the final car, but you rarely see one of these real IROC cars. And of course, IROC stood for International Race of Champions. They take 12 drivers, have four tracks, usually NASCAR tracks, towards the later years of the series and race them against one another. Usually it was mostly NASCAR drivers versus IndyCar drivers. Sometimes it was breaking into some sports car drivers, Formula One, World of Outlaws, drag racers. But during this time, it was mostly on NASCAR tracks with NASCAR drivers versus IndyCar drivers. Dodge came into IROC in 1990 as the official race car of the IROC series. In 1994, so the Dodge Avenger replaced the Dodge Daytona as the car used for the series. Lady, you're way too excited. And you're this way car way has extensive history. This right car now. was used in the IROC series from 1985 to 1995. And it was always the yellow car. No matter the race, no matter what kind of chassis it was, whether it was a Camaro, a Dodge, a Dodge Daytona, or Avenger, it was always the yellow chassis, the yellow car. Now in the IROC series, they had a, they're all color coded and they all had assigned numbers. And this car was last used by Allen's or Junior at Watkins Glen in 1995. According to the paperwork, it's the very first Banjo Matthews IROC built race car back in 1985. By the way, sorry, I was listening to your conversation. Just trying to be helpful. You're welcome. So if you'd like to use the According to paperwork, some of the drivers as races car was obviously Allen Jr., like the, the Yar Kelly Yarborough, I think Bobby Allison, I don't, Dylan Hart, I don't think drove this car, Mark Martin. Stickers. Anytime you saw a yellow race car on the IROC race from 1985 to 1995, it was this car. <laughs>
Oh, my God.